Hey bees, I'm Marie from Humble Bee and Me, and I can scarcely believe it, but right around now, Humble Bee and Me is turning seven. So today, kind of in honor of seven years of Humble Bee and Meing, I'm going to be talking about some of the things that I don't do anymore when I'm DIYing. There is a partner post for this video on the blog. It's more of a retrospective on the last year and a look at some of my like favorite new recipes and ingredients and things like that. So the content's slightly different, but you know, they're both like, woohoo, birthday, Humble Bee and Me is seven kind of themed uh, pieces of content. So yeah, if you wanna check that out, I'll throw the link in the description box below, but let's dive into stuff I don't do anymore. I think the topic I've learned the most about since getting started in making things is in regards to safety and preservation and how to formulate products that can be properly, effectively preserved. I owe a huge thank you to Jane Barber from Making Skincare for really opening my eyes to this and she has so many wonderful, wonderful resources on both her website and her Facebook group that have really helped me learn so, so much. So I will link to her website and to her Facebook group in the description box below because both are wonderful resources if you're interested in learning how to make things. Because of that learning, I now no longer formulate things that are impossible to preserve. Um, I think back on some of the things that I tried making within like my first year of um, making things and it's amazing that I didn't hurt myself or make myself sick because I did some stuff that I now know is very, very risky. Um, so some of the things that come to mind, uh, I tried making a lotion with coconut milk once and that like that lasted like maybe two days before it just started to smell absolutely rank or something a little more benign um, sounding something that didn't go bad quite as quickly um, infusing herbs directly in water and then making lotion out of that water when you do that turned out tons of botanical matter from the herbs diffuse in the water and you can't get all of that out and so that creates a significant preservation challenge because it turns out that botanical matter is delicious so Things like that I don't do anymore because I know better and it's kind of a bummer in some ways because some of those ideas, they just, they're so seductive. They sound so delicious, coconut milk lotion. Um, but yeah, sadly, not a thing that we can safely do at home. So I don't do that anymore. I used to buy floral waters at the grocery store because they are much cheaper than floral hydrosols that you buy from DIY suppliers. But at some point in time, I did buy a bottle of rose hydrosol from Voyager. I was sort of like, oh, I wonder if these are different. They are so different. True hydrosols are just, just so much better than the stuff that you get from the grocery store. You can use significantly less of them. The smell is so like potent and intoxicating that you can use far less of them and still get that scent coming through in the end product. You have way more selection. Uh, the grocery store usually just has like rose and, and orange blossom, whereas you just like, you can get white spruce and chamomile and rose geranium and so many gorgeous, gorgeous true hydrosols if you're getting them from a proper DIY supplier. And I find the scent also really sticks around a lot longer and is much more resistant to being uh, heated in your heated water phase. So just mm, true hydrosols kick butt over grocery store floral waters every day of the week and I will never waste my money on grocery store floral waters ever again unless you know it's for cooking. So I don't count essential oils and drops anymore. This is in part because I now have a wonderfully accurate scale that you know, I didn't have when I first got started. The scales I was using when I first got started were accurate to one gram. This is accurate to 0 0.01 grams and fantastic. I got this from Lotion Crafter. Um, so having a more accurate scale definitely helps because when your skill is only accurate to one gram, you I can't really register just a couple drops of an essential oil. Um, but I definitely credit Formula Botanica's coursework and uh, Tisserin's Essential Oil Safety for Professionals textbook on really sort of opening my eyes to the importance of knowing the concentration of your essential oils in your products and weighing them out and not counting out drops. If you've been following me for a while, you will probably notice this next one already, which is that I don't use strictly really crunchy natural ingredients anymore. So when I first got started, I used pretty much exclusively things like plant-derived oils and butters, essential oils, clays, waxes, that sort of stuff. 
As I've learned and grown as a formulator, I have gradually incorporated more and more sort of not supernatural ingredients into my products. And my products have improved for it. Emulsifiers like emulsifying wax NF and polo wax mean that I can make really lightweight, fast absorbing lotions, the sorts of things that I really like to use. Incorporating lake dyes into my cosmetics means that I can have really, really bright colors that you can't achieve with iron oxides. Starting to work with surfactants has allowed me to create facial cleansers and body cleansers and shampoos that are pH appropriate for our hair and our skin. Because the more I learn about the needs of our skin and our hair and the physiology of our skin and our hair, the more it becomes apparent that sometimes natural things really aren't what your hair and skin needs, even though you know it does sound very lovely, but it's just not well suited to what your skin actually needs to thrive. I've written a few blog posts about this that I'll link to in the description box below. I would really recommend giving them a read if you sort of want to learn more about my uh, expanding ingredient philosophy over the years. Uh, there's definitely far too much in there to cover in a multi-point video like this, but I think the pieces uh, do a very good job of explaining where I'm coming from. Something else I don't do anymore is consult the EWG Skin Deep database for ingredient safety information because frankly it is just not a very good database. It, uh, say so one of my biggest beefs with it is it doesn't discuss usage information. If you took a hot chili pepper and you stuck it in your eye and you learned, you used that experience to judge the safety of chili peppers, you would never eat spicy food. But there are safe ways to use chili peppers that don't typically involve sticking them in your eyes. And that's true for a lot of the ingredients that the EWG really, really demonizes. They're also not very consistent. Just today, I went onto their website and I searched for petroleum jelly. So the first result is petrolatum, because that is what petroleum jelly is made of entirely, it's petrolatum. And it got a four, which is like, oh, a mm, little suspicious, a little dodgy, you might want to be concerned. And then the following results were for things like Vaseline, which is 100% petroleum jelly, a couple like store brands of 100% petroleum jelly, and all of these things, which are also 100% petrolatum, got a safety rating of one, which is like, hey, that's actually really safe. It's like, what the heck? They're exactly the same thing. So why is petrolatum a four, but Vaseline is a one? They're the same thing. So I've written more about this. I'll link to the post in the description box below. And in that post, I've linked to a bunch of other posts by a bunch of um, respected cosmetic chemists and other people who have done good research into um, the EWG and their database. So I would really recommend giving that a read if you are still using the Skin Deep database to vet the safety of things because yeah it's just not a very good place to start your research unfortunately though it is really really easy. Something else I don't do anymore is moisturize with just oils and butters. I now have a ton of watery things in my skincare routine and my skin has improved so much. There seems to be this idea in the really crunchy kind of beauty and skincare community that water is this like cheap filler and oil is its like significantly superior alternative, but they are different. They're very, 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 very different. Uh, if you were thirsty and someone handed you a huge glass of olive oil, you would not be stoked about that because what you need is water, right? And it's the same with your skin. Your skin needs water. Oil can also be very great, but it really needs water. So I have incorporated a ton of water into my skincare routine in the last couple years and my skin has improved immensely for it. I no longer refuse to use products that I didn't make myself. And for three great reasons. One, it's great to stay kind of apprised of what is going on in the skincare industry. What are the trends? What's happening? It's a really great way to learn. Two, it helps make me a better formulator because I am exposed to professionally formulated products. I get to experience them, see what they feel like, see how they perform. I can learn a lot from that and it gives me things to strive for. Or it can be a sort of, hey, I don't need to buy that. I can actually make a really great version of that myself. And then the third one is, there are some things that I can't be bothered to make myself, but I don't want to eliminate completely from my life. Like for instance, um, you can sort of see my hair has some curl to it because I curled it yesterday. Uh, I don't do that very often, but when I do, I want to use a heat protectant spray, but I also, like making a heat protectant spray isn't something that hugely interests me at this point in time. So I can still have a heat protectant spray and my hair can be, you know, heat protected. I don't have to make 
everything myself. So that's also been, yeah, pretty big change. <laughs> Something I really can't do anymore just as a function of the size of the Humble Bee in the audience, and I really love you guys, but it is just me. Um, and I get a lot more correspondence than I can handle as a single human and also keep publishing new content. So I do prioritize public questions that are relevant to the piece of content that they are asked around. So if you have a question about a recipe, please leave a comment with your question. Uh, and before you do that, maybe check the other public comments and see if somebody else has asked your question because there's a decent chance that they have and there's a decent chance I've already answered them so you could get your answer immediately, which is, I think, <laughs> always the best situation. And something else, and I'm kind of nervous about saying this and I don't even understand why because this shouldn't be controversial. If somebody is a jerk to me, I'm going to ignore them. Disagreeing with me is not, does not make you a jerk. <laughs> You're gonna say like, hey, I was reading this thing and uh, it like disagrees with with what you've said like take a look at this give this a read That's totally fine, and I welcome that kind of uh, Conversation and discourse But I get comments from people calling me twits and telling me I look like a giraffe and that I'm an idiot And if I'd only tried harder I would know better and I'm a complete failure of a human because of I don't know any multitude of things No Those people do not deserve any of my time I am going to ignore them, and that is the absolute most that, they're, that they deserve. All right, so those are some of the things that I don't do anymore. Definitely not a comprehensive list, but you know, some of the highlights. Uh, I'd really enjoy hearing about some of the things that you have you know, learned about, things that have changed in your DIY and creating philosophy as you have learned and grown as a maker. So thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe if you love the sort of things that I do. I would really appreciate you checking out my Patreon account to help support Humblebee and me. This is my full-time job and uh, yeah, me not having to get a job, another job, means that I am able to do a lot more here. So I would appreciate that very, very much as a, maybe a Humblebee and me birthday present. But thanks so much and I'll see you next time.